This is Mike Conza. Welcome to Novelist Spotlight. This is the program where we interview published novelists to learn about how they succeed at what they do and to gather insights to make ourselves better and more effective writers. In the spotlight during this episode is my youngest guest ever, just 20 years old. Chloe Terranova is creator of the Terranova Universe, taking advantage of that really cool surname. The Terranova Universe is a new superhero universe filled with new superhero characters and their intertwined stories. Chloe Terranova's first novel is titled The VMCA, and it is the first installment of what will be the VMCA series. Later this year, Terranova will release the VMCA 2. There is also a novel titled Mason Grave in the works. Terranova is an avid listener to alternative music and is fascinated with chemistry. Currently a student at San Jose State University, majoring in English with an emphasis on creative writing, but Terranova is destined to head to Los Angeles to start studying film as part of the aspiration, as you will hear, to not only write novels, but to see some of those novels come to life on the movie screen. And in fact, maybe even be the director who brings them to the big screen. Without further delay, here is my interview with Chloe Terranova. Chloe Terranova, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me, Mike. It's great to have somebody as young as you. And you know, when you talk about the Terranova universe, it's, I think some of us who have been writing for a long time forget or don't appreciate the powers of creation and destruction that writers are imbued with and entrusted with. And to see something on this scale, something so bold from somebody uh, so young, it's it's really inspiring for those of us who have been around for a while. Okay, Chloe, so for starters, uh, talk about the Terra Nova universe. What are the physics or parameters of that universe or, or multiverse? Tell us about it. Well, Terra Nova universe is my superhero universe. It is very expansive. It has lots of stories on Earth. It has stories in on other planets, other galaxies. It is not a multiverse. I'm not a huge fan of multiversal concepts, dimensions, time travel. So it does stick to one singular timeline. And Terra Nova Universe is going to start at one point. And all of the stories are going to go through that one singular timeline in order. So when you're talking about superheroes, superheroes are always imbued with some kind of power. What about these characters? What kind of powers do they have? First of all, I have supernaturals and mutants are my two types of main superpower beings. The supernatural beings were imbued with supernatural powers and mutant beings. They were born with certain genes that gave them different powers. I have a lot of different superpower beings in these stories in the vmca my main character has super speed and some other powers which i sort of made up one's called gravitational adaptability it means that they can walk on air sort of they can move on air and then they also have this power called the unknown which is like a substance, a black substance that can sort of grab things and touch other things. So they use it sort of like a rope sometimes. It's a little bit difficult to explain without like an image or reading the actual book. Okay, so that's a challenge for you. You have to um, actually describe all of this in a way that it becomes graspable for the average reader. Why go this route? You have created an entirely different reality. So what is this doing for you that you felt like you couldn't do in more traditional writing where a person is um, dealing with the world as it exists? So why, why the supernatural? Why the supernatural? When I was young, I was always really into superheroes and fantasy science fiction. So when I decided that I was going to write stories, I really wanted to stick to those genres. So that's why I write about superheroes primarily. I think that it's really interesting too 
to see these characters who rise up and decide to use their powers to protect the world, but you also get to see more into their heads and their lives. You get to read about why they're doing it is, why they're doing what they're doing and being heroic people, the choice to be heroic people, I just find it very fascinating. And I think it's something that's really cool to explore that you can't explore in just realistic fiction. Well, life is so limited, really. I don't think we think about it that much, but we only have six senses um, or five senses, maybe six senses and so on. Uh, it can be really limit limited. Uh, but when did you start writing? When when did uh, this occur to you that you actually wanted to begin writing and creating uh, this alternate reality? I first started working on Terra Nova Universe when I was in sixth grade. I believe that was 2014. Wow. And a fertile, I had been writing a little bit before then, but I started getting committed to this idea of a superhero universe at that time. And I started making all these different characters, some of which I've kind of left behind and then others who are like stars in all of my books. What does writing do for you? I mean, when you write uh, emotionally, mentally, what's the payoff for you? That's a really good question. I think that for me, I just really, really love reading stories and just hearing stories. I've always loved that. And for when you're writing something, you get to choose what kinds of stories you want to tell, what stories you want to read about. So I like to write stories that I couldn't necessarily find anywhere else. And for me, that's just something that I find really helpful for my life because I learn a lot about myself when I write certain characters or I go through certain stories. Give us one or two things you learned about yourself that maybe surprised you. Could you share that? I know this is writing's intensely personal, even though you put it out there to everybody, there can be dimensions to it that are highly personal. But if if this is fair territory, tell me maybe a couple things you learned uh, from from writing these stories that uh, about yourself that maybe surprised you. I would say probably the biggest thing that I've learned about myself from writing these stories is how I connect to certain traits of different characters. I have a lot of characters. And there are some that I just constantly go back to and I'm mesmerized by them. And I'm like, why am I so interested in you specifically? And then I figure out that it's because there's something about them that is some quality that they have that I didn't realize I had. Like in my book, the VMCA, the main character, Sim Turnover, Sim and I have a lot in common. And one of the things I realized about myself when writing this character was that the way Sim feels about other people. Now, Sim is one of your main characters, correct? Yeah, Sim is. Okay. The way Sim feels about people tends to be very internalized. And so Sim's not really that expressive with emotions on the outside and is not, does not say a lot about how they're feeling, especially when it comes to other people. But it's something that is like very important and very powerful that is kept in their head. And I've found that I kind of have that same mentality when I'm thinking about other people and how I feel about other people. Interesting. Now, do you worry at all about having too many characters? You say you have a lot of characters. Everybody's read books at times where they felt like there's so many characters, it's hard to track. So, and, and you have what? A, uh, you have a, a few primary characters who really drive the narrative, I would imagine. And just in terms of all the additional characters, is there any concern that, that you might have too many, that it, that it muddles the story, or that it makes it difficult for the reader to track? 
Because that's always a concern for, for writers uh, when they are introducing multiple characters. You know, it's funny because every single time I have a new story idea, I always talk to my brother and I'm like, I have this new story idea and it's going to have all of these new characters and it's just going to get bigger. And I'm like sort of concerned about it, but I'm going to do it anyway. But I think one of the big reasons why I'm writing about an entire universe and not just one series is because I can't just focus on one character or one group of characters. I have so many ideas and so many characters that I want to share with the world. So by creating a giant superhero universe, I can have different stories that focus on different characters and I can go back to characters that I really like to write about. And then I could just explore all of these other people. So in that way, I don't think it gets too big because each story has a certain amount of characters. And I think individually, the stories are easy to keep track of. So as the series moves forward, there's going to be certain characters who are going to be repeat characters and there's others you'll dispense with. Is that, is that, does that kind of sum it up? There are some who I will come back to a lot and there are others who will either appear less frequently or they won't appear at all or they died. So if they died, then they're not coming back. Now, VMCA, it's an acronym. Is it is it meant to be an acronym? Does it stand for anything or is it just VMCA? It does stand for something, but I actually don't spoil what it stands for because it's a reveal at the end of the first book. Oh, okay. Okay. But the concept works for the second and beyond that as well. But okay. Yeah. So spoiler alert. Well, no alert. We're not going to go there. Uh, <laughs> so uh, there you have that. Now, do you realize that... You know, I mentioned earlier the Terra Nova name. You have a really cool surname. I mean, do you do you realize that? Because you're using it for Terra Nova Universe. Nova is actually a, you know, a a stellar body, a, a, an astro, an astronomical um, reality out there. Uh, is do do you see your name as something that's an asset for? Um, yeah, yeah, you must, because I mean, you're calling it the Terra Nova universe. It's rare that people really see their own name as something that's, um, uh, really something that could be taken advantage of. It sounds like you do, or am I reading too much into this? No, you're definitely not. I was very fortunate to be born with such a cool last name. And when I was first working on this universe all the way back in sixth grade right away i knew i was gonna call it terra nova universe because it just seemed too perfect you know nova has to do with as you were talking about stuff in space and i just think of the universe as a whole as just a whole lot of space and the science fiction aspect is really cool but terra nova itself can mean like new land that's the actual meaning of the name so i kind of interpreted it as new universe interesting so we were talking before we started recording about your um, schooling right now you are at san jose state university and you're studying english with an emphasis on creative writing if i recall correctly but you're going to be uh, entering film school down in the Los Angeles area. Talk about the decision to make this change of major. What, what's, what's behind it? What are you thinking? I was always really good at English. That was my thing. So when I got into college, my first thought was to stick with English and stick with the writing because I love to write. But when I was there, I realized that I can write on my own time and write my own stories. I don't need to go to school for that, but I've always loved film and I've always wanted to be a part of film in some way. And I feel like film is something that you have to learn a lot more hands on. There's a lot of technical stuff that school can teach you. So I made the decision to switch 
to a film major and I decided that I wanted to go to LA because that's such a great place. It's the hub of film, really. It's where all of the bigger studios are at. And I just thought that it would be a good idea for my future and for what I want to do with my film. Well, now you're a writer but you're also obviously thinking cinematically. Do you write with uh, with cinematic notions in mind? Do you write thinking in terms of how does this translate to film or or even that you just want the writing to read like a screenplay as much as it is a novel? Yeah, I actually do. I don't know a whole lot about screenplays. I've never written a screenplay, but I do write my books as if they're a movie. It's actually interesting. I realized a while ago that people don't always read books the way I do. When Ever since I was young, when I read a book, I see each individual shot. So it's playing in my head like a film is. And so that's how I write my books. I write them by like, you know, thinking that, we have a close up of this character and then this character starts talking. So we switch the frame or we're going to pan to the right to show the door that they start looking towards when they hear a noise. I, to what... I totally, totally. It's I've said this before on the podcast. I'll say it again that the advantage writing has over film and I love both, of course, just as you love both. But with writing, you get to be a co-creator because you are visualizing and I, I don't think this is the case with everybody it obviously is with you it is with me that we visualize the character we visualize the situations but when we go to the movie the director gets to make all the decisions so I'm in a position where I just have to watch what they've created I can't go co-create because they've made all the choices they've, they've put all the imagery in there all the music all the uh, segues it's all uh, I, I'm kind of on the sidelines and with reading, and I don't think a, there, a lot of people don't get this because there's uh, pitifully few people who really read aggressively. And by aggressively, I just mean reading a lot and reading something, not not social media postings, but reading actual works of art and writing uh, novels, uh, well-crafted novels. Uh, a lot of that, a lot, a lot of people, I think, just aren't very visual in that way. And so the writing doesn't come off the page for them. I hope you factor that into your um, what will be your film career as well as your writing career, maybe even your video game career, where that's an opportunity where people can make some choices. It can all be baked into that cake. And uh, I don't know if you have any interest in video games. Do you play video games? I do play a lot of video games, yeah. What kind? I like to play role-playing games primarily. I play a lot of games on my phone just because I don't feel like I have to commit a lot. I'm not a PC gamer. I know that's very popular. But one of the most recent games that I've really enjoyed was Life is Strange. I like that. I also like strategy games. There's a game called The Cave that is probably my favorite game I've ever played. That was a really, really smart and interesting game. How many hours a day or week do you figure you're, you spend gaming? Um, I think it varies on the day because I game more if I am not writing, if I can't figure something out in one of my books, because I like to play video games to do something with my hands while I think about what I'm trying to work on. So on a good day, I probably play for only an hour, maybe even less than that. But if it's a bad day, I'll probably play for longer. So a good day of writing, let's say. What's a good day of writing to you? Describe it. Like how much, how, what's maybe the word count, the amount of time you get to devote, and so on. Or the, it might not be quantitative, it might be qualitative. Yeah, the quality is definitely the most important part. To me, a good day of writing is just me sitting down for a pretty extensive amount of time and my hands just keep moving. You know, I'm 
on a good streak and I can just keep going for a while and I actually have to stop because I have something else to do, not because I'm suddenly stuck and don't know what the next paragraph is going to be about. So it's not necessarily a word count thing. It doesn't matter how many words I get done in the day. It just matters that my inspiration is still there and my ideas are still flowing. Talk about writer's block. Have you ever suffered from writer's block or is that not uh, a place you've been before? Well, I don't like to say that I've suffered from writer's block because I have enough ideas where there's always something in my head that I feel is still moving. But there are times in my life where I've been working on a story and it's usually something very technical or scientific because I like to keep my books accurate and I just don't know how that was going to happen. And so I have to sit down and think about it for a while. I usually talk to my brother to try and help me get through that. How imaginative do you get during the day when you're let's let me let me just throw something out there as a uh, maybe maybe a concept you're you're in school you're at your professor is teaching and you think in terms of your professor being an android or some some other life form other than a human being do you have those kind of and, and I don't mean specifically that I just mean do you try to bring almost a psychedelic or multidimensional um, feel and approach to your surroundings and the people who are populating it? No, I've never done that before. Usually if I'm thinking creatively in my life, it's just me being in a place, doing whatever I'm doing, like listening to my professor lecture and my mind, like half of it is in a different world or in one of my stories on a different planet, just trying to figure out what I want to write next or thinking about the characters and the stories and the concepts. That's how I just let my imagination play around in the day. So it's it's separate time that you do. And I tried to turn you into an acid trip. That that obviously is not how you how you live. You, <laughs> you have separate creative time. And it's a good thing. Uh, I'm sure your parents are happy that you're paying strict attention to your professor and not trying to multi multitask at the same time. Um, let me ask you about the statement on your website. It, it uh, I'm quoting from again from your website it says music is very important to the stories of Terra Nova Universe. Here you can find the individual playlists for each novel listed in chronological order. Expand on that for us. Uh, I've never seen, I've heard of playlists for people who are preparing to write or it accompanies their writing, but you go deeper than that with this. So talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I love music. So my work is sort of a compilation of a bunch of things that I like. Like I like superheroes, I like film, so I see it in a film way. And I like music, so I like to incorporate music. I think that music is a really nice way to enhance the writing. And I make a playlist for each one of my books. The playlist is made up of music that either the characters are listening to in the actual story or stuff that they like to listen to. It's kind of like if the book was a movie, it's the soundtrack that would go with the movie hmm. and would play during specific parts of it. But the movie's in book form. So it's the playlist that goes with the book. Interesting. So uh, the a particular song, you're into alternative music, as, as uh, I had mentioned at the top. Are there specific songs that then actually create for you a particular character or scene, or is it more j just enriching the environment by having that music as, as you say, kind of a score or a soundtrack? Is it the latter or the former? 
Yeah, it's all about enhancing the story for me. I already have the characters and the relationships all in my head. And as I'm writing them out, I try to find music that tells the same story, but musically. So I try to find music with lyrics that match what the characters are feeling, or I try to find the right sound that a song might have that would go with the scene or with the characters and their emotions in that moment. Okay, so you're already doing some movie directing in a sense. You're, <laughs> you're really you're connecting it up and thinking in terms of how this how I would put this on the silver screen. Um, very interesting. So I'm not sure you're aware of this or not, but there's many of us who early in life decide we want to be a writer. But what happens is the fear of writing and the fear of failing, the intimidation and the procrastination, it all goes with writing so often, pushes us into much later years. Uh, we don't start writing until, in fact, in my own case, I remember during my 20s, I was probably in my mid 20s, and I read a newspaper article about a gal, but her name was Jennifer Jones. And she had just got a three book deal and she had, was only 30 years old. And I set that goal for myself that I wanted to get published by the time I'm 30. Well, I didn't get published a well after that, not because um, I was producing work that was necessarily subpar. I wasn't producing work at all. I mean, professionally I was, but this is, this is the human condition for so many people, which is why it's really impressive that you at such a young age uh, age 12, I, I forget what age you, you started um, really thinking in terms of this and actually doing some writing, but there's a tremendous fear factor and intimidation factor involved in writing, of fiction writing in particular. Did you feel any of that along the way or you just had a clear path? I mean, it was one of those things that it was um, just coming out of you and you had to act on it. Yeah, I'm not necessarily afraid of failure, but I am definitely afraid that I can't portray the stories and the characters specifically the way they deserve to be portrayed or be portrayed a lot of the time. But I have a very strong dedication to the characters specifically. They're all very important to me. And that's why I find I keep going, even in my lower moments, I think to myself, you know, you can't, you can't give up because you started telling their story. And if you just don't finish it, that just is not fair to them. You know, it's not fair to their experience and also what their stories could do for other people if other people read them. You know, the part of what I was talking about is also that people sit down, everybody thinks they have a book in them. So many people think they have a book in them until they sit down to actually try to write. Then they realize how really difficult it is. And it's, it's torment to sit down and want to write and feel really discouraged with the lack of quality coming onto the page. And uh, that's a big, that's a big part of why I think people are very set back in their writing and will set it aside for weeks, months, years before they ever get back to it. And then really are able to dig into it in a way that, that actually produces um, a completed, a completed novel. You have two in the works right now. You've got VMCA2 and then you've got Mason Grave. Uh, that can sound a little overwhelming because you got them both going at once. How close are you to completion of VMCA2? The VMCA2 is the, the entire first draft and second draft have been completed. It's gone through some beta reading, so I'll draft it again, but it will come out sometime this year. And Mason Grave is how far along? Same same place, except that one needs more edits from me. It's already gone through some beta reading, and that one will probably not come out for a little while, like at least next year. The VMCA 2, I took 
I took a little break from publishing VMCA one. So I have all of these books backed up. I have VMCA two, I have Mason Grave. I have my Anubis book, which I'm currently working on right now. So I have all of these stories that are closer to being ready, but I just kind of want to space them out a little bit when I publish them. Sure. Understandable. So Mason Grave is, is obviously not part of the series, but is it connected to the series? T tell us about Mason Grave. What's what's kind of the the um, story there? What can you tell us in a nutshell? So Mason Grave is the first example of Terra Nova Universe branching off into different stories. The main timeline, as I mentioned before, it's going to start in one place, and then all the stories are going to go through this timeline to the very end of it. The VMCA one starts the timeline, so that's where all the stories are going to start up. And then there's the VMCA two. Mason Grave is a character who is featured for a bit of time in the VMCA two. So those who have read the VMCA haven't met her yet. And she gets her own book series that's like a branch off of the VMCA two. So you will see her in some VMCA books. You will see some VMCA characters in the Mason Grave books, but it's primarily her story. And it's kind of like, I don't know if you're familiar with the Marvel Universe, how you can have different stories like Captain America, Iron Man, Black Widow, you know, and they're all separate, but then they can all come together, yes. but then they separate again and have their own little stories going on. So it's like that but through books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's been huge. The Marvel and, I mean, just superhero movies have been huge. You're you're obviously a cinemaphile, so, or cinephile, I guess, is, is the proper pronunciation. Um, tell, tell us about the movies that maybe were, maybe the directors or the movies, or both, that made the biggest impact on you or you see as maybe guideposts in your own development as a movie person, as a movie uh, director and uh, maybe screenwriter? I really enjoy writing about stories that have superheroes, of course, because I write superhero stories, but that also have a lot of focus on the characters and their relationships and more realistic fiction type aspects of that. So I like a lot of movies that share those qualities or even that have those qualities separately, but they have a large focus on them. A movie that I really loved was The Goldfinch. I thought that that movie was very beautiful and it's very underrated in my opinion. I really like to have sort of realistic moments like that in my books. I also, of course, love the Dark Knight series. I thought that that was a very cool way to have a grittier Batman that wasn't too far into like the rated R section. My favorite directors are probably Christopher Nolan and Quentin Tarantino. I think that they have a really good balance of dialogue and storytelling and their movies tend to be like very visually awesome too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they are. What about favorite authors? Name some novelists who made an impact on you. I think the biggest novelist to have an impact on me would be Stephen King. I read his book on writing and I found that very inspiring, not because he would tell you how to write, because he didn't really. what. He's, what he did was he told more of the story of somebody who became a writer himself and how he became a writer over time and how, you know, at the beginning, he just loved storytelling and he loved movies, too. And then he ended up writing and started telling his own stories. And I just think it was really cool to read about somebody who started, you know, kind of nowhere, but then became massively successful just because of his dedication and love towards the craft. Yeah, there's so many times that book, 
is brought up by so many people as as being influential. And there's so many good writing books out there, yet that Stephen King book is brought up time and again. I read it myself. I really enjoyed it. Kind of a combination memoir and writing guide. Uh, but as you say, he doesn't tell you how to write, but he kind of gives you the tools that, uh, that allow um, a person to write with more. I mean, one of my favorite... Um, parts of that book was when he said you need to come to the keyboard or to the page with attitude you've got to have bring an attitude to it um, basically kind of know who you are and bring some he didn't say aggressiveness but i uh, that's what i read into it because uh, as you say his dedication was has is just rock ribbed i mean the guy um almost writes for sanity um, I've heard him say almost as much as just basically it's either this or go insane. I've got to, I've got to write these stories. Now you referred to characters repeatedly, and I oftentimes will ask writers, what aspect of your writing game is your strongest? Is it dialogue? Is it narrative? Is it is a plot? Is it characterization? Um, what I hear from you, without you actually answering that question, it sounds like character. You really embrace these characters; they're, they're precious to you, and they're the ones driving the story. Is that accurate, or is there some other part of your writing game that you consider uh, the one that's the bigger driver? Yes, that's very accurate. Characters and their relationships. If you don't have good characters or compelling relationships, I just find the story to be kind of boring and bland. So it's very important to me that my characters are interesting and also that I care about them. If I don't care about the characters, then other people probably aren't going to care about them either because I'm not as dedicated or passionate about them. Now, um, I want to get back to the Goldfinch for a minute because you mentioned the movie. Did you read the novel by Donna Tart? Or did I you just have see? it, but I have not had time to read it yet. I think that's why the movie, uh, many people pan the movie is after reading a book, especially a book of that scope. It, it's a big book, and it's my, my wife read the book. It's probably her favorite novel, and she couldn't watch the movie. She didn't like what she was seeing, and it's like, that's not... Getting back to the co-creation thing, it's like, that's not who I saw. Those are not my characters. And uh, so the, the movie maker lost her on that. You know, nowadays, though, nowadays, we've got streaming series. And, I mean, you grew up with that, Chloe, but you have to understand that um, for us who are farther along in years than you are, when a book went to a movie, you had an hour and a half to two hours to make that thing work. And it just almost was doomed from the start. You really had to take in some aspect of the book, some aspect of a character or characters to make it work. Now with streaming series, hell, you could do War and Peace and do, you know, a dozen seasons a year for, for 10 or 12 seasons. And you could embrace, uh, you could actually wrap your arms around War and Peace. Um, so... I bring that up because you're thinking in terms of movies, but I assume that you'd also be thinking just as seriously about a, a Netflix or a um, Apple series uh, as well. Or are you the kind of person who really likes the 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 containment of a 90 or 120 minute movie? You know, honestly, I am not a huge fan of the streaming services. I don't, I mean, we have a lot of them, but I don't watch a lot of TV shows. I kind of feel like most TV shows just get really drawn out. I don't like how they're slow paced a lot of the time. I wouldn't completely take it off the board for the future of my work because I don't feel like that's a smart idea. You have to look at all your options and really think about it, but I don't feel as passionately about TV shows. I get it. I do feel that in almost every series I've watched, by its, after season two or three, it drops off. And it might go for six or seven or eight seasons. And 
once once I see the decline, I mean, it kind of peaks. Then you go into the decline. And remember David Crosby, the late David Crosby, who died only you know uh, a handful of months ago, said it was the same thing with bands. He said a band reaches. I know you're a music lover, and a lot of our listeners are music lovers. So it's a um, uh, it's a point I want to make that he said you're with a band and you hit a peak and you know when you've peaked. And he says, and it's all downhill from there. Then it's all just a fight to try to be as good as you've been, or the band members start to come apart in various ways. And he says, once once it peaks, I'm I'm out. I've I'm done. I want to move on to something else. So, and I think you can extrapolate from that, and you really see that with with the series as well. That's one of the reasons I just loved um, the Queen's Gambit. It was one season, and that was it. It was hugely popular. I don't know anybody who wouldn't um, find the Queen's Gambit entertaining or interesting. And I remember saying to my wife, I just hope that they resist the pressure and they don't try to do another season because it's destined to be a disappointment. And that happens. It can happen with books as well, where Harry Potter is going to be X number of volumes. And if J.K. Rowling was to break that and decide, no, I'm going to do more, um, it's almost inevitable that there's going to be some level of disappointment there. Talk about what obsesses you. I feel like we've covered a lot of this territory in the conversation, but if I was to ask you that question, you were just to synthesize it down to um, one or two or three things. What what do you obsess over? You mean writing-wise? Writing-wise or, uh, yeah, any any uh, creatively, let's say. I think... Other other than my dedication to my characters, because I'm definitely obsessed with my characters, one of the themes that you will commonly find in almost every single one of my novels that is already here or is to come is I like to deal with a lot of darker themes, darker aspects of people's minds, sort of corruption, whether it be just a character you know, going through a rough time themselves or actually having issues because of some supernatural force. Talk about how you want to see your career develop. I mean, if you were to write your bio, looking out 10, 20, 30, 40, even 50 years, you're so young, it could be, it could, you can literally look, look out that many decades. How would you how would you see your career developing if everything comes to fruition in the way you would like it to? Give us a sketch. Well, over the next however many years, really all my life, I would like to do this. I would like to keep writing stories. I'd like to get all of the novels and the timeline done and out there so that people can enjoy them and they can see the universe as a whole and how it all connects together. And I would like to have movies made of this content at some point. How do you expect your writing to change as you age? Do you have any sense of that? I mean, again, you're, you're, you're 20, you're, you're young, and, but you can look back from the time you're 12 to 15 to 20 and see that your sensibilities have changed a lot. As you look forward, do you have any sense for how your writing will evolve with age? Naturally, I hope my prose gets better, <laughs> like my flow with words. Have you ever, you have so many ideas, and I I, I know what that's like, because I, I feel like I'm in that place too. Have you ever abandoned a novel or a story because your other ideas were nipping at your ankles and and in, in my case, it, it almost is, a, is a, a, a kind of a mind game that my brain plays on me, which is it tries to get me off the task, which sometimes can be painful because you have this other idea. And then I start to think, you know, I really have a better beat on that idea than the one I'm currently working on. So I should probably throw this aside and work on that. I can always come back to this one later. You know, over time, I realize it's just a mind trap. Uh, have you had instances where that's at play or have you abandoned uh, a a story or novel you're working on because either for that reason or because you just decided this isn't working out the way i want to and i'm going to move on to something else it's not 
I don't I don't think it's it's uh, developing the way I want it to. I have not yet abandoned a story and I don't plan to because the way my universe works if you drop a story a whole chunk of it's gonna crumble so you can't really do that unless you want to cut out multiple stories Hmm. i do have ideas that will as you say nip out my mind a lot when i'm working on other things and i find that the best way to deal with that for me personally is to take a brief break from whatever it is I'm doing to open a new document and write up a bit of that story so I can get the feel for the characters, their like speaking habits, the story so that I have enough information where I can go back to that in the future and I'll remember everything important that was inspiring me at the time. I refuse to write past a certain amount of pages with these new ideas because then I'm never going to get anything done. So I have to stop. I have to cap it at some point in time. And then I return to whatever it is that I was working on in the first place. And most of the time I find that I have renewed vigor for that project because I missed it. So in a way, it's kind of a way to get my creativity back in action. So the um, I want to ask you about I've got a couple different questions I'm juggling right now, but the I'm curious whether you outline your books or you let them develop organically. What's your method? I do not outline. I can't outline. I've tried a few times before in the initial process of my books but what i find is that you can't really outline a book right away because if you do that then or at least for me specifically for me specifically what ends up happening is the characters i didn't know them that well at the very beginning so i had all these ideas that I thought would have worked, but they were never actually going to work out that way because I didn't know the characters. Once I start writing more and I start learning about the characters, then I start learning that, oh, well, obviously this would have happened, not whatever I had planned. So I just kind of dropped outlining because I thought that it was wasting my time. I would have come up with all these ideas and then it wouldn't have happened so i just like to let the characters lead the story they can take me wherever they want to go and i get to learn what's going to happen like i'm reading it for the first time so that's pretty exciting yeah yeah so yeah with character driven books it makes sense that the you, you need to let the characters drive it and uh i once worked with with a uh woman who they would actually visit her in her dreams they would come to her when she was working on a book. They'd come in her dreams and would actually give her some direction as to where um, they wanted to go. And uh, and she um, uh, she listened to her characters. Are there any rituals that you um, observe that prepare you for writing or during the writing process? Any, any kind of ritual or rituals that um, work for you? I don't really have a lot that I'll do habitually just because I write all the time, any time of day when I feel like I don't have a specific time of day that I write. I just do it whenever I'm available. The only thing that I can think of that I do do quite often when I'm writing is every once in a while, if I'm at home, I'll take a short break and I'll go pet my dog because I love to give him attention. He's really sweet. And then when I get back to the writing, it feels like I've had a little break and then my brain's all rewired and ready to go. So let me ask you, uh, again, I, I hate to keep referring to how, how young you are, but to the aspiring novelist out there who in, in most cases is going to be older than you, 
um, who hasn't really gotten started yet on his or her first effort, what would what would your advice be uh, to getting to getting started for uh, the newbie? I know that it's very commonly said in a lot of writing groups, but I would say just to sit down and start writing because that's the first step to everything, really. If you want to write something and you don't actually sit down and start writing, it's never going to happen. Every writer's got a voice, and um, some people spend their whole careers trying to find that voice. Do you feel like you've got a particular voice that um, that is going to have continuity throughout these novels, the Terra Nova Universe novels? And what kind of tone is it? What, well, how would you describe the tone of that voice if you indeed um, have a voice that's consistent and will be part of the continuity of the series? You know, that's an interesting question because I feel like that's something that a reader would notice more than a writer. I feel like a lot of writers think they know how their book reads and sounds, but of course readers have different interpretations and different feelings towards stories. I myself would probably say I don't have a tone that's going to go through all the books just because each individual book is told from the perspective of a different character and my writing changes a little bit depending on who the character is so there will be like a, a certain tone that will match up with each series with all the different characters but the separate series probably won't sound exactly the same do you write for yourself or do you write for an audience, first and foremost? Are you, is your writing something that is for you or do you think in terms of a market or an audience? I think that I do write a lot for myself. I really enjoy it. I really love learning about all the stories and connecting with the characters. So in that way, it's very much for myself. And even if I didn't find success, I would still do it because I can't imagine a world without any of these characters in it, especially my world. But I do want to be able to help other people. I write a lot about some deeper and darker concepts, which I feel are important to be explored. I write a lot about mental health through my characters specifically. And I would like to share that with other people because I think that it could be helpful to some people who need to hear it, who need to read about certain people who feel the way that they do. So in that way, a part of me writing is writing with the hopes of helping other people too. Hmm. Interesting. So, um, if you were to hold a dinner party and you could invite any three people, living or dead, to attend, what three people would you pick? Whether they're they're movie directors or authors or or historical figures or superheroes. This is a really hard question. <laughs> So I'm going to decide not to take any of my my characters with me because that would just be a dinner party of me and all my people. <laughs> um, the first person I would invite is probably Meryl Streep. She's my favorite actor. I think she's fantastic and very versatile. I'd love to meet her one day. Just to, I'd be in such awe. The next person I'd invite would probably be Christopher Nolan because... As I mentioned before, he's one of my favorite directors. I'm very inspired every time I watch one of his movies. So I'd love to talk to him about his visions for movies and his directing, how he gets it all done, because there's just so much going on a lot of the time in his work. And he, even as a writer who writes about so many different stories, I am very, very surprised that he can like hold things like inception all together and it just all makes sense in the end and the last person i would probably invite 
this one might be a little weird, but Venom from the Marvel Universe. Venom's my favorite superhero ever. And sometimes he can be not that great, but like invite a, a nicer version of Venom. He's really funny in a lot of the comics. Is Venom a bad guy superhero or a good guy? It depends on which comic you're reading or which movie, I guess. The newer movies with Tom Hardy, he's sort of a good guy. He he does some sort of bad things, but he's a good guy at heart. And comics like Lethal Protector, that one, he's trying to be a better person and use his powers for good. What is his superhero power? He's an alien. So he has all of these alien powers. Um, they're kind of like Spider-Man, except he's supposed to be stronger in almost every way. You know, I want to jump back to something you said just a little bit earlier. You were talking about, I would continue writing even if I wasn't commercially successful at it, because I can't imagine living in this world without these characters, these these superheroes or these characters. And I don't think a lot of people, non-writing people or even non-fiction people, they, they don't really understand how when you create characters, how personal it is and how precious they can be to a person and how real they are to a uh, an author or a movie maker even, that um, it's a very heady sort of thing. And uh, just the just the opportunity to be able to create situations and people and relationships and so on. Obviously, you've taken that to the, uh, you know, you put put that on steroids by creating an entirely different dimension of reality or an entirely different world. But it's um, a lot of people I don't think understand that because they haven't experienced it. But a lot of the stuff that we consider that most people could consider fiction to be something that's not real. I don't buy that. I don't. I, but I'm a person who believe that, believes that dreams are real and that hallucinations are real and so on. They're simply different expressions or dimensions of, of, the, of reality, of the world that we live in. And um, I just throw that out there. You have any thoughts on that, Chloe? Yeah, no. I definitely think that, you know stuff like hallucinations or being able to see into different stories that that is something that's very real there's a line somewhere in one of my books i can't remember which book it is because there are so many but one of my characters asks the question isn't life basically fiction and the idea of it is that you should be able to reverse that and isn't fiction basically life and in a way it is because fiction is all based on real life so you should be able to flip that then and in that way i think that fiction is a very very valid way of looking at real life and real concepts real relationships and emotions i think it's also a very important way and creative way to talk about some of these concepts absolutely we imagine it first and then it we manifest it whether it's airplanes computer systems biological treatments fiction writing movies you name it it all starts with the imagination chloe terranova uh, i am really impressed with what you've done so far and i think there's really big things ahead for you and i hope that the terranova universe becomes a supernova that I'm sure you dream of it being, and um, just promise me that I'm going to have you back on this program when you are too busy to take all the speaking requests that you're receiving. I really appreciate you coming on the program. I wish you the best of luck. Thank you so much for your, all of your time, and I really appreciate being on your podcast.